nice in here. I like the Holy Spirit is going to be taken over as He works through me, so please be attentive to that. Try not to cause any distractions or disturbances that might hinder somebody from getting the message that the Spirit wants to say to the church tonight. Amen? Amen. I'm glad we're here. One body, Amen. many parts. Awesome. All right, we're going to begin tonight in James chapter 3. One of my favorite books, the book of James. Mary put up on the board there, and I have to move a little bit there on that one. Back up, as always. <laughs> Keep this in its proper context. We're going to back up to verse 13. Thirteen of James chapter 3. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life. So right then and there saying, if you're wise and really understand God's ways, prove it by the way you live. That's what he's saying. That's the proof that you really understand God's ways. By the way you live your life. Look what it says. Living an honorable life Doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom and humility, God's wisdom and humility together. We take no credit for doing good things anymore. We give all the glory to God. Amen? Amen. And you know, we're humble enough to understand that. We don't get prideful and say, oh, look what I accomplished. No, it says doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Understanding is nothing good in me. It's only through Him. Now look what it says in verse 14. But if you're bitterly jealous in this selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. That's what? Worldly wisdom. And that's what it produces in, in people. Worldly wisdom causes jealousy, right? And selfishness. For jealousy and selfishness are not of God's kind of wisdom. Look at verse. Look what it says. Such things are what? Earthly or worldly, unspiritual, and demonic. Can you imagine what it's saying? That being selfish and jealous, bitterly jealous, is demonic. So if you're doing if you're jealous and bitter in the Christian life, you are being controlled by a demonic force. That's what it's trying to tell us. Jealousy is evil. When people get jealous of what other people have and what other people do, it's evil. It's not from God. That's what it says. In lying or selfishness. For Look what it says. And look at verse 16. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and evil of every kind. There it is. So that's why we don't want that kind in our church. Because that's what you'll find in churches. Okay? Now look what it says. But the wisdom from above. Now God's wisdom is first of all pure. It is also peace loving. It loves peace. Okay? It's not a peace taker. It's a peacemaker. Okay? Gentle at all times. See, at all times, in willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness or of good things or of justice. Amen? So that's why people say that they know the Word of God. If you know the Word of God, this is the proof that you do. All these things right here, peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others, full of mercy, and the fruit of good deeds. If you think you're smart by the world standard, you're full of what? What are you full of? Selfish ambition and jealousy and lying. 
So you can say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm full of jealousy and lying, and I have none of this fruit operating in my life when I'm not in church. I'm not loving, peace-loving, gentle at all times. I'm not willing to yield to others. It's still all about me. I'm not full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds, and I'm not showing favorites, and I'm always sincere. That's, a matru that's what maturity is. That's what spiritual growth is. Okay, not how many times you read the Bible or how many times you went to church. And this is what Christians turn into Pharisees over these principles because they think they know the Word of God and they really know nothing because they can't show any love to anyone, not even to themselves. That's what's wrong with the church today. They take pride in their achievements and accomplishments and boast about how much of the Bible they know. No. You want to boast? Boast about how much of the Bible you live. And that's the process that we do at this church, okay? We not only learn it, we hear it, but then we want to apply it to our lives, right? And we leave that. Now, we know that we're not perfect, right? Thank God for His what? His grace and tender-hearted mercies to begin afresh every morning or we won't be able to do it. But there's a goal in the Christian life. It's to become more and more like Christ and less and less like jealous and evil and selfish. See, that's the goal. Amen? Amen? Okay, that's a great scripture. That's why, you know, they want to take the book of James out so they can so they can get the grace message and tear it out and say, just live the way you want. You don't have to change. You don't have to transform. I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. If you think you're saved and going to heaven, prove it by the way you live when you're not in church. If you really think you're saved, you will be transformed. Something will happen to you. That's the evidence of our salvation. Amen? Amen? Don't let anybody fool you about that. Nobody. Because we've died to this life, and our new life is here with Christ and God. Amen? We have a new life in Christ now. We have a goal to get rid of that life and start this life. Not bring that life over. Amen? Amen. Amen? Thank God for that. Churches teach the wrong stuff. Amen. We ought to change. We are to become like Christ. We are to like yield to others. Not be so selfish and greedy and always looking for money and, and make, make to make more gains in life mm -hmm. down here. It's more like getting rid of that stuff and making more gains to that eternal kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then submit more of your life to His will. Not your own. You're not coming to church just for your own selfish ambition. Mm -hmm. Amen? Like a taker. I see people in church just taking, 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 taking. Never willing to be used of God to show some fruit. Amen? Beware of people like that. They say they're of God. We already talked about that, right? All right, we're going to finish our message. We're going to continue on when we finish it. I let the Spirit speak in this ministry, amen? amen? So, we're going to be talking about the hope. God of hope. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? amen. All right. That was a beautiful scripture to get us going, right? Amen. We want the wisdom from above. Not the wisdom from down here. All right. By the way, I had something different. But today, the Spirit was speaking to me to bring something else in. And I just yielded to it and put it together. This is the way it goes. Right? Yeah. This is a Spirit-led ministry. Yeah. There's no formulas involved. Follow Christ. All right. There are many key terms and concepts in Scriptures like faith, hope, Love, joy, grace, peace, pleasing the Lord, etc. That we come across as we read our Bibles. Amen? We come across these all the time. But often, these are just vague concepts for many people. The following study with is designed to provide a condensed biblical explanation of hope as it is found in the Word of God. God is called the God of hope. Amen? The God of hope. This means he is the source of all real hope. If we are going to have hope, confident expectation, it must come from him, for he alone has the power to give it. Friends, on what have you fixed your hope on? Does your life prove it? Does the way you live prove what you hope for? Has it changed who you are? What you value? And what you are doing with your life? See, once we get saved, things start to change in a believer's life. The course of our goals start to change. We no longer seek to get more stuff down here. We start to give that up and start to seek more of the things of God. More studies, more reading His Word, more doing His will, more finding what our gifts are. 
because the Holy Spirit is now filling us and we are under new management, so to speak. We're under management of the Spirit, which tells us that we don't need that stuff anymore, not to seek that. We know we still need money, we still need to go to work, but that's no longer our focus in life. And our goal is to become like Christ now. And that's the problem we struggle with, right? We still got this evil flesh that wants its ways, right? I want to do this. I want a better job. I want a better life. I want a better man. I deserve this. I deserve that. Why am I here? Instead of just sitting under the teaching of the ministry of God's Word and reading the Word of God and letting Him speak to you, say, God, what would you have for me here? Let me do your will. And He will show you what it is. But too often we always go after what we want. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Okay, what is hope? Is it a wishy-washy maybe or a kind of unsure optimism? The modern idea of hope is to wish for, to expect, but without certainty of the fulfillment. Mm. Right? You'll say like, well, you know, I hope my car starts today, not knowing if it's going to or not. That's not the kind of hope in the Bible. The hope in the Bible says, He's, if, God, if we hope if God said it's going to happen, it will happen. Amen? There's no like, doubt about it. Mm. Biblical hope has no doubt behind it. It's going to be a fulfilled condition. Amen? It's not like, oh, I hope I become like Jesus. No. If you do the things the way God tells you to do them, you will become like Him. Amen. But you have to follow the principles and obey the word of truth. Or else you'll never become like that. It'll never happen. You have to follow the principles of the Bible for the promises to be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Okay. In Scripture... All right, but without certainty of the fulfillment, to desire very much, right? To de desire very much, but with no real assurance of getting your desires met, okay? Getting them accomplished. In Scripture, listen now, according to the Hebrew and Greek, words translated by the word hope, and according to the biblical usage, hope is an indication of certainty. Certainty. Hope in Scripture means a strong and confident expectation. Through archaic... Today, in modern terms, hope is a, akin to trust and a confident expectation. Let me tell you something. You put your faith and trust in God, it will come through. Amen? Amen. It's trust and obey. Faith has to get strengthened for hope to get accomplished. Amen? Faith and hope are together. You can't separate them. Without faith, there is no hope. Because we can't see hope. Amen? You can't see hope. Hope may refer to the activity of hoping, or to the object hoped for, the content of one's hope. By its very nature, hope stresses two things, okay? Listen now. A, futurity, and B, invisibility, okay? It deals with things we can't see or haven't received or both. See, if we already have it, we have nothing to hope for. Get it? Yeah. It's not fulfilled yet. We hope for something. We don't have it yet. Okay, for in hope we have been saved. Okay, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Amen? Amen. It's coming. Listen, we know heaven is our home. We don't know when he's coming back, but we know he is. Yes. You know, we hope he comes back sooner than he's going to. We don't know. Well, sometimes we have a bad day saying, Jesus, come today. <laughs> yeah. Right? We put our confidence in our own desires. But he's like, be patient. Look, while you're waiting for me, I'm going to change you. You see, it's what we do while we're waiting that counts. You don't just sit by, live your life, go invest, do this, do that, while you're waiting for God to come through. No, God already did come through. Now we wait expectantly for that promise to be fulfilled. Amen? And in the meantime, we what? We read our Bibles. We study the Scriptures. We what? Minister to people. We try to bring, we try to do the will of God while we're waiting. Amen? Yes. Because listen, if He comes back right now, it's hopeless for the people that aren't saved. If He came back now, it's hopeless for them people. Yeah. We want to get them saved. So we don't want them to come back because we want other people to get in the kingdom. Don't you want family members that aren't saved, saved? Yes. So if he comes, if you wish for them to come back, that's a selfish statement. Yeah. 
We're saved. We know we're going. But we want to help others get saved now. With a life worthy of the call. We just don't sit on our, on our laurels and wait for God to come and, and do his thing. No, we're what, transform and bring others into the kingdom. Have you done that with your life? Or are you still satisfying your own desires? That's the question. I'm a Christian. I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back. Well, what are you doing while you're waiting? Are you becoming like him? Are you prepared for when he comes back? Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Biblically, from the standpoint of the object hoped for, hope is synonymous with salvation and its many blessings, past, present, and future, okay? As promised in Scripture. This is true even with what we have already received as believers, because these blessings come under the category of what we cannot see. Okay? We may seem we may see some of the results, but it still requires faith and hope. Amen. For example, we do not see the justifying work of God, the imputation of Christ's righteousness to our account, nor do we see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we are saved. We don't see him. You see the Holy Spirit? No. But you know you have it. See, that's what we're talking about here. Nor our co-union with Christ. We believe this to be a reality. But this is a matter of our hope. We believe in the testimony of God in the Word and hope for the results in our lives. Amen? We hope that He makes us like Jesus, don't we? And let me tell you something. Has God given up on us? No. Ever since I became a believer, He's never given up on me. I've given up on Him more times than I can count. And went back to my ways, right? And found out that it all comes up empty in vain. Because God's not working fast enough in my life. So I'm going to go make something happen. Mm -hmm. And we all end up making a mess. And he said, wait on me, just do my will while you're here. Don't worry, the best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. Believe all. Yes. In summary, hope is the confident expectation, the sure certainty that what God has promised in the word is true. Has occurred or, and, or will in accordance to God's sure word. Amen? That's why we read the Bible from cover to cover. If you don't understand all the promises of God, you've got nothing to hope for. How many enjoy reading the Bible now? Wow. That's a transformation in itself. Yeah. See, we don't even, we don't, draw, we don't joyfully glorify in that. Well, before, we wouldn't even think of picking up a Bible. Yeah. Right? It sits in the corner of the house from the family Bible with dust all over it. Now we want to get in it and read it. That's, that's beautiful, right? God fulfilled that in us. He changed our desire. Before you had no desire to do as well, now you do. Amen. And the only way you're going to do as well is if you read His Word. Amen. Don't let any Christian fool you. If they're not reading His Word, they're not doing His will. If they're not connected to a church, they're not connected to Jesus. Amen. Don't let them fool you. There's no way. The Bible tells us what has to take place for a believer to be conformed to the image of Christ. Amen? Amen. You have to be connected to the body, which is Christ, the head of the church. Amen. And that's what we're doing here, right? We're connected here, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me give you a description. It is dynamic or active, a description of hope. In the Bible, hope is never static or passive, a passive thing. Okay? It is dynamic, active, directive, and life-sustaining. All right? This is everywhere obvious as we read the word. Take a concordance, look up the word hope, and you will find reference after reference pointing out the active results of hope in the lives of those who truly have a biblical hope and live accordingly. In other words, a biblical hope is not an escape from reality, okay, or from problems. It doesn't leave us idle drifting or just rocking on the front of the porch, waiting for him to come. Mm -hmm. If our hope is biblical and based on God's promises, it will put us in gear to begin doing his will. Amen? Mm -hmm. To begin doing his will. Amen. It has results. All right? Let's start in Romans 15. I've been explaining hope for a while now. Because it's so important in the Christian life to have hope that God is going to accomplish everything He said He would in us.
to let him yield when the Spirit speaks to things that need to be spoken. All right, look at verse 4 of Romans 15. Verse 4. Such things were written in the Scriptures long ago. Why were they written in the Scriptures? To teach us. So that knows that we have to read the Scriptures, right? Because the Scriptures are what teach us. Okay? And who's the ultimate teacher? The Holy Spirit. That's why, listen, it's imperative that believers read the Bible and the Holy Spirit will speak to them. Amen? Through the Word of God. And make sure you can understand what you're reading. And the Scriptures give us hope and encouragement. Listen. They give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. See, while we're waiting for the promises to be fulfilled, we stay rooted and grounded in Scripture because they give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently. Just imagine if you don't read your Bible and you're just waiting, waiting, waiting on God. You end up becoming worldly again because you can't wait. This is what keeps our minds fixed on the things of God. And as we patiently wait for the promises to come, while, while waiting, we're becoming like Him. Amen. You have to keep reading the Scriptures, though. Amen. It's not an idle thing. I don't care how long we've been believers, right? The more you've been a believer, the more the Scriptures you need every day to feed you. And you know what You know what Christians actually do? Well, I read the Bible now. I'm all set. I'm just, I don't need to keep reading it again. I have it already. I'm smart. You get a bunch of Pharisees in church. They don't even know the Word of God because once you read it, you read it again and again and again. I've been reading this book. I don't. I can't count how many times I've read it, and I'm, God is revealing things more and more to me as I grow. I don't have to look anywhere else. He teaches me as I read, and as I read and as I mature, He reveals something else to me. It's like, well, I don't have to go outward. Right? See, the things that are already revealed, I have to practice first. And then he reveals more. Amen. Christians say, well, oh, I already know i got to love others. What's next? Let's look, let's look into a second coming. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let's, let's get into end time prophecy and the second coming. But I can't do one thing to show love to another believer. Amen. So let, hurry up. Let me go to that. I already arrived. I don't need that. Amen. I don't need 1 Corinthians 13. I need to know. I need to go to Israel to see where the temple is going to be built. <laughs> I already read the Bible. This is what they do. Instead of becoming like Christ, they start transforming. They want more and more and more when they never live what the Bible tells us to live. They get amen for that. Amen. This is what Christians do. They get too smart. They're too smart for God now. Hmm. I'm going to wait for the second coming and I'm going to know when he's coming. This, that, and the other thing. And that's, guess what? Nobody knows when he's coming. Yeah. The, the, the Bible tells us to be ready when he does. Amen. Now look what it says. I'm going to read it again. Such things were written in the Scriptures long ago to teach us. And the Scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives this patience, where do we get our patience from? God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live. Listen what it says. Listen what it says. May God, who gives this patient and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other. You see it? Only God can give, let us allow us to live complete harmony with each other. Because if you know it as well as I do, people in church have disagreements all the time and end up splitting over them. Yes. There's no harmony. There is harmony, though, from Genesis to Revelation. If a believer reads the Word, you'll never get into a point where they have to divide over something. Mm -hmm. Because it really doesn't matter. The unity is in the Holy Spirit of Christ, in the Bible. Amen? Some people might think, oh, we're going to be here when, you know, for the tribulation and we're going to be whisked out of it. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because we can't control that anyway, so I focus on that. Mm -hmm. And then you split hairs with other Christians and they end up leaving over it. And that has nothing to do with salvation. Nothing. Or why he saved you. Look what it says. The live in complete harmony with each other as it is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus, right? Then all of you can join together with one voice. You see it? Giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Amen? Mm -hmm. 
What's wrong with churches now? Why are they in such turmoil? Because they don't read the simple Bible. They've got to add stuff to it and take things out of it. Get all kinds of intellect into it. And then they've got all different kinds of denominations from it. And nobody's really loving Jesus. Nobody even hears of Jesus. All they hear is theology. And all these high and lofty words about God. And it's, it's as simple. So unless you become like a child, you've never seen me. Yeah. It doesn't make you smarter. It's supposed to make you less smart. And more like depending on Christ. Amen. Amen. And it does the opposite in churches. They get all smart and everything. And then you've got nobody like Jesus. Nobody's looking like Jesus. You don't see Jesus there. He's like, wait a minute. I'm trying to get in over there. Oh, no, you can't come in. You don't know enough. You don't know enough to come in this church. You've got to join for a sign here. Where do you work? How much do you make? Yeah. Fill out this envelope. I want to see yeah. what you got. <laughs> then you can come. Yeah. The churches that do that, right? They heckle you. Get in the door, they heckle you. Hey, how you doing? Where do you come from? Where do you work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, how you doing? You know we tied here. We get a, you know you're going to get dumped in the water, right? That's what the Bible says. <laughs> So I already took a shower. I'm not saying. <laughs> I already took a shower. Water can't wash away my sins. If you want to do that as a testimony, that's fine, but that's not going to change you. Getting wet don't change anybody. Ooh, I got, I got baptized today. Look at me. That's what it does. It just focus on them. Look at me. I'm a Christian now. Really? No, you have to become a Christian by living out what you believe. Showing the world. Look at verse 13 now. It's a bunch of nonsense. It's about time the churches go back to the basics of the Bible so people can actually live that way. And the church is growing and full in harmony with each other. Oh, what church you go to? Oh, I go to the one of Sega. Oh, yeah. Oh, we read the Bible too. Oh, good. Good, come to our church. We read the Bible. Oh, no, come to my church. We do this. We believe that in our church. This church does this. This church goes on missions. This, look, one body, many parts. Yeah. We all are accountable to one person, one king, Jesus. Yeah. There's not one denomination in the Bible. Why would anybody follow that? Nonsense. Instead of following Jesus. Yeah. Because it's, you know why? Because it's structured. It makes me feel like I'm doing something right. I follow in that formula, it makes me think that I'm closer to God. Mm. No living like that makes you feel come closer to Him. But doing the right thing and living right is what gives you the confident assurance of your salvation. Mm -hmm. Not what church you join or how many things you've done for God. The evidence of salvation is a changed life. Are you born again? Mm. Or are you still the old person when you leave here? That's the question. If you are, that means the Holy Spirit never entered you. That's what it means. Because when the Holy Spirit enters a believer, things start to change. You start to be accountable to God. You start to get convicted. You start to say no to things you used to say yes to. Amen. It doesn't, it's not idle. No, you transform. Amen. And if you ain't transformed, that means you really never believed it to begin with. Because when you believe it and God puts His Spirit in you, you can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. You can try to run away, but he's always there to get you back. A lot of us run the other way, right? Like Jonah, right? Yeah. Matter of fact, did you see it on TV? Some guy got swallowed by a whale. I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, they believe it, right? <laughs> oh, did not just people... I digress. But Jonah was going the other way. He didn't want. He didn't want to do God's will. I want my will. And God says, "No, I saved you. You're mine. Remember, you're my slave now." And He gets us back. And if you don't come back, it's because you never belong. The Bible says, "Don't fool yourself, Christians. The human heart is wicked and deceitful. Who could really know it? A lot of people say they believe it, but they don't believe it because the life hasn't changed, and they really haven't done nothing for the cause of Christ. Amen. They're still living for themselves." Don't you ever believe that? Something happens. And some of you go to a church and say, Oh, yeah, you're saved. God's great, saved you. It's a gift. Don't worry, man. The gift is a changed life. That's the gift of salvation. A changed life. Something you couldn't do before. That is the gift. A changed life. 
<laughs> born again. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that, right? For doing for me what I could never do for myself, like change. You could never change, right? You try to change, you do the same things over and over again, right? Amen, Amen right? All right, go to, uh, look at verse 13 now. Stay in verse chapter 15. You hearing me so far? Yes. I love my church. I love this is my this is my life right here. I lay my life down for this. Amen. And that's what I do. Sleepless nights. Always studying, always doing what God's with tired. Never about me. My vacation's in heaven. It's gonna be paradise. <laughs> There's nothing but problems down here. No matter where you go. Yeah, it looks beautiful, but you can fall over the cliff or get stuck <laughs> on the mountain. <laughs> It looks good from TV, too. I can see it. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, it's in the Rockies or whatever. They look good. It's safe for here to watch them. I'm trying to go there myself and see it, right? People never come back. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> right? Well, I want to explore. i got to put it in my bucket list. Oh, you might not ever make it back. That's where they try to get excitement, you see? Try to get adrenaline. Try to get fulfilled somehow, right? Yeah. The only fulfillment is with Jesus. See, when you start doing this, even though you're tired and weary, you get completion. You're fulfilled when you're doing it. You're never fulfilled doing that stuff. Or trying to make money, or trying to do this, or trying to follow the ways of the world. It's never, we're so miserable. You can see it in Christians. You know when a Christian's following the world, because they're miserable all the time. Because they can't do God's will, because they're doing theirs. And God makes us even more miserable than before we got saved. Yeah. And then people end up going on medication and all kinds of things, so they don't feel miserable anymore. But let me tell you something. It's meditation that gets us feel better. To do God's will. Look, when you do things right and you do things for God, that makes you feel better. It takes you out of the slump. Amen. That's a big amen. Amen? Amen. You can't fix what's wrong in us with a worldly fix. It won't work. It won't only make us Needing another thing, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. Yeah. All right, go to Romans 12 now. Stay in Romans. Now, I just want to make one point. There's nothing wrong with medication when you need it. You've got a cold, you take, you know, you take something. But when you have to take something to alter how you feel or the way you think, mm -hmm. then there's a problem. Only God can do that. He put that there for a reason. He put that in you so you can see Him and find Him and go to Him. But when you block that, you can't get to Him. Listen, all of us don't feel like doing things a lot. Listen, whenever I try to change my feelings, right, with the world, I end up feeling empty even more after it yes. gets fulfilled. It's insatiable. So there's nothing that's going to work. And people don't understand that, and then they end up not ever finding Jesus. Mm -hmm. Alright, look at verse 1 of Romans 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, he was pleading with them, to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. First, we have to understand all he's done for us. You see, this is the key to the Christian life, to really understand what he did for you at that cross. Mm -hmm. He didn't just die for your sins. He did so many different things for us that we have to find it after he does. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. See it? Your body is a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Or this is your spiritual worship. Or this is your reasonable service. Now look what it says in verse 2. We're all Christians here, right? Look what it says in verse 2. This is simple. It, it's simple but hard to don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you, mm -hmm. listen now, by hocus pocus. <laughs> no, it's not. This is what people do. I'm going to go get delivered right now. I want to let God transform me. Zap! You're no longer in that anymore. That's not how it works. It tells us right here how it works. How does it do it? By letting God transform you. By what? Changing the way you think. This book changes the way we think now. We start to think like God and not like the world. It's not rocket science. But if you don't read it and apply it, you'll never change the way you think. 
That's why Christians come out with the form, because they think like the world and the word, and they can't really get it. This has to transform you. Then you will, listen, then what happens? Then you will learn to know God's will for you. See, it says it right here. You have to learn that. That's not something that happens naturally. We have to learn God's will. See it? By following Him, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Okay? God's will is good and pleasing and perfect. What does He mean perfect? A mature Christian, a Christian is, is, is perfect. What does it mean? That means you can sit down and wherever you're at in life, whatever's going on in your life, you are stable. Amen. No matter what's going on. If all hell's breaking loose at work, on the road, next to you with your husband, you are still stable and following the directions the Bible tells us to follow. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's what it does. It gives us stability of our soul. All right, let's, let's move now to Romans chapter 12, verse 12 now. You know, you can always say, oh, I hope I get better. I've been going to church for a long time. I hope I get better. No, you're going to get better. Look, as long as you start doing this, as your, as your lifestyle will start to change. But you have to follow this wholeheartedly. That's the key. Wholeheartedly. Let me say it again. Wholeheartedly. You have to be all in. You ever watch one of them, those poker games? They say, I'm all in. Every chip they have, they throw it in the pot, right? That's what he's saying for us. Your whole life, I'm going to give it all to him. All to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He says, I give you a clean slate every day. You're going to be all in with me. Follow me. Read my word. Do my will. Always think about what I can, what you can do for me. And this is how it gets fulfilled. Amen? It's always when you think of you where the problems come. Yeah. yeah. Amen. I gotta get a better church. I gotta get better here. I gotta get a better this. It's all about me still. My fulfillment in life. No, you died to this life, the Bible says. That's why Christians never grow. That's why Christians never find their gift. Because they still stuck in themselves. They won't give their life. They won't go in wholeheartedly. You get an amen for that? Amen. And there's nothing wrong with it. God still loves you and you're gonna go to heaven, but you're not gonna enjoy the fullness of your salvation now. How great it is to be in joy, no matter what's going on, to have joy. Boy, I'll tell you, if I was to depend on my feelings, I'd have to quit this. Because the devil tries to take me back every day. Yes. Every time I try to advance in the Christian life, the devil tries to bring me back in my flesh. Yeah. Hey, John, you know, you should make extra money for your family. You shouldn't be going to church so much. You shouldn't be so churchy. Churchy. You shouldn't always be thinking of God. You shouldn't always be thinking of that. You should have some balance in your life. You should always, you should, you know, you should have some things. You should be doing some things down here too, you know. And I say, no, those are the things that cause me problems. Those are the things that God has to take away from me. That's the stuff that keeps me from Him. I got to fight with the devil. Yeah. Because he makes it sound good. Oh, I got to take Him. I got to feel it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. He says, seek the kingdom first, all these things will be added to you. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, I put it to the test, and it works. Yes. It works. My wife will tell you how many times I denied what I wanted to do for the ministry, mm -hmm. for God, for you. Amen. For you, why? Because that's what God told me to do. Yeah. So if you love me, you love them. Yes. Yeah. And if you really love me, you'll love the people. And then you start to say, it's all about him, not about me. And then you start getting fulfilled. Say, wow, when I give is when I receive. The problem is I was always receiving. That's why I can't get no joy. I'm on the receiving end all the time. Amen. When the true joy comes, when you get rid of receiving, it's not giving. Amen. Amen. That's when the fulfillment comes. And people can't get that in their heads. Even Christians, I still got to take care of number one, me. Just imagine if I said, as a pastor, well, you know, I'm tired today. I worked too many hours. I got to work overtime. Ah, I'm not going to show up. And I don't come here because I think that I need to make more money. Now, the Bible says that each part of the body is just as important as well. Everything that, everything that you're part of, just as important as me being here. But nobody sees it that way. 
they were, well, I'm not going to become accountable because if I do, that means I can show up all the time. I can't get out of it. You see, but becoming accountable is the key to freedom. Amen. When you become accountable is when you get victory over the flesh. Amen. That's what changes you. But when you don't become accountable, when you freelance and stay uncommitted, you never, ever, ever overcome the flesh. Never. Get any amen for that? Amen. Amen. That's the truth. All right, let's look at verse 12. Are we getting this so far? Yeah, thank you. I don't want to see anybody in here live a defeated life. Nobody should be living a defeated life to come to this ministry because you're getting taught the truth. Amen. If you live a defeated life, it's because you don't believe what the Bible's telling you. It's an unbelief that keeps you from succeeding. Look at verse 12. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. How many times do we get mad or whatever and stop praying? Well, get angry and stop praying. Yeah. Look, be patient in trouble. How many times when we get in trouble are we so impatient? <gasps> always frazzled when trouble comes. Always squirming to get out of it. When he's saying be patient in trouble, he's trying to test you. He's trying to change you. Look what it says. Look at verse 13. When I'm in need. Oh, it doesn't say when I'm in need. What does it say? When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Let me ask you this. Is everybody in here always willing and ready to help? Are you always available? Is your phone always on when somebody gives you a call in the Christian life to be there and answer the phone and be there for somebody? Then you'll know where your heart really is. Well, when you leave, you shut your phone off and don't want to be bothered. Yeah. Can't get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. It says to be ready when God's people are in need. That's Christian maturity. That's yeah. maturity. I'm not going to play no punches here. You really know where someone's heart is when they're not here and you try to get in touch with them and you can't reach them. Yeah. Because the Bible tells us to be ready to help them. Look, always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. See it? Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Let me tell you something. I see people, people that are having a bad day and sad, and people next to them, ah, just suck it up until I'm having a great day. And digging into them instead of just weeping with them. Say, wow. Instead of coming down to their level and weeping with them. You know, you don't boast that you're doing good and they're doing bad. Look what it says. We put those who we live in harmony with each other. Do you do you see harmony in churches really? It's sad. Yeah. You don't see harmony in churches and you're telling me I'm a mature believer. It's a lie. We need harmony in the church, especially this church. Yes. Yeah. This church needs harmony. Nobody's better than anybody else. No matter how many times, how many times people come, people will know. When somebody shows up, you'll be ready to help them. Yeah. 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 You don't count how many times they've not been here. And then don't don't show up and don't be like be with them. There are brothers and sisters no matter what. Yeah. How many times they come here or not? Because yeah. you come here faithfully all the time doesn't give you the right to snub somebody yeah. that has it. I don't want to see that ever happen here because if I do, I'm calling you on it. Yeah. It's wrong. You know what? You believe in Jesus Christ, you're part of our flock, whether you're here or not. There's people on the line. How are they going to get here? Say they live in India. They're part of our flock. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. We love them just as much as we love the people we can see be with. And the people that can't be here all the time, we love them too. That's the proving practicing grounds to help us grow and be acceptable and make allowances for each other's faults because of our love. It's to show our love and our unconditional love to other people that may not be so perfect. When they're attendants. Mm -hmm. They're not here all the time. I'm not going to give them the same treatment. Mm -hmm. Wrong. It's evil. Mm -hmm. It's wrong and it's evil. Because you know what? God puts them people in us to test us where we're at in church. Mm -hmm. In church. In church. So if we can't get it right in here, how are we going to ever do it out there? We're going to be haters. That's what the world sees, Christian haters. Christian haters. 
wrong. It's evil. Look what it says. Live in harmony with each other. Verse 16. And don't, look what it says. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, look at verse 19. Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. And that's Deuteronomy 32 verse 35. Amen. Okay? Says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals of shame on their heads. And where's that coming from? Proverbs 25, 21, 22. Don't let evil conquer you. Listen now. You conquer evil by doing good. You hearing me, Christians? We conquer evil here by doing good. We don't fight evil with evil. How do you fight? You have to remove and replace. How do you get rid of your own nature? You remove it, and then you replace it with a new nature. You don't just not do evil, you overcome it and you do an act of good. Yeah. That's how you change. Again, amen for that. Amen. And that's what we're hoping for. A transformation. Something that people can see and actually do have an effect down here on the kingdom of darkness. Who wants to overcome the devil? Well, we have to do things his way. Yeah. It ain't going to happen our way. Amen? amen? But we have to do it in unity. See, we can't over the, you can't overcome the devil if only one person is trying. All of us have to fight evil with good. We all have to be in harmony with each other so it's complete and healthy and the church is functioning properly. Amen? Amen. All these are just as important as I am to God. And it's just as important that you help each other. It, 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 it doesn't matter who, how, what. It's just be available. Use me, Lord. But Isaiah said, God said, I'm looking for somebody to help. You know, I, they said, use me. Is that what you say when you get up in the morning, Lord? Use me, Lord. Mm. Be careful when you say it, though. When he uses you, it's going to be a little different than you think. <laughs> His will is different than yours. But let me tell you something. It produces a better result than your will ever will. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to have to stop there. Thank you. Let me share that with you. Right. God is good. Don't let evil conquer you. Conquer evil with good. Romans 12, 21. Remember that. Take that with you. Amen. Brittany's going to come up and sing and we're going to close.